as we, uh, we did. So, so, so we try to cover as many. There, it's unfortunate, there are so many topics to cover when you do mobile, uh, uh, for, for Linux mobile phone stuff. Okay, um, welcome, Luca. We have seen the first pair of phone with you being used as a presenting device this morning. So now we are going to, to learn how to put the kernel on it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so kind of very quickly, who am I? My name is Luca Weiss. Been maintaining phones since like 2017. I'm um, a postmarketer's core team member, and also my day job is uh, Android platform engineer at Fairphone. Um, kind of about the background of how the whole situation. So I mean, uh, Qualcomm has a lot of lot of uh, SOCs like system on the chip. Uh, there's quite a lot of or actually already supported. So you see the, all this, all these wonderful numbers here. There, there's a, the, the ones launched since 20, 2018, so like in the last four years. And they're already supported in mainland, as in they have a DTSI file, and you can build something on top of this, and it's booting. Uh, but of course, there's also many, many others that are not supported, um, especially mid-end ones, like the high-end ones are normally very quickly supported by Linaro. So like, for example, the SM8550 um, is the newest one. It was basically supported on day one, or it's the same with the S, uh, SM8450. Um, but yeah, the other ones are not, but you can, of course, do it yourself. Um, so the device, Fairphone 4, uh, used the Snapdragon 700, 750G, it's the SM725. Yeah, launched like a year and four months ago, running the 4.19 kernel, so which is already, I mean, we had 6.2 nearly. Um, and yeah, like what I have so far working on the 4.9, uh, on the, on the 6.1 or 6.2 kernel, is like yeah, all the basics that you can see here. Um, USB, including uh, nearly the USB role switching. You so you can actually plug in, for example, a keyboard into the device and not just use it like as a gadget. Um, internal storage on the SD card, so the UFS um, and other things. Um, display with backlight control, which is separate components, touchscreen, GPU, um, Wi-Fi. The remote prox, which is like separate um, cores in this, in the, on the SOC. They are actually all booting, but uh, at least for the modem one, I'm actually not really able commun to communicate with it. Mobile data could also in theory work, so the, the Linux driver initializes, it actually gets the remote proc up, it already does some, some initialization things there, but it's not really testable without actually having the modem up. Uh, so it's kind of, kind of untested, it's upstream already. Um, vibration motor, the um, flash and torch LED, which is actually um, was upstreamed recently, or is in the process of getting upstreamed. Uh, the camera I2C bus, so I can actually talk with like the I2C set and I2C get commands. I can talk with the camera um, and like get the get the chip ID. So so that works, but yeah, not really much more useful with the camera yet. And also lots of other plumbing, which includes like um, yeah, of course, are the I2C buses interconnect, so like the bus scaling, uh, cache scale, cache scaling, and yeah, bunch of other stuff that's useful. So kind of what isn't working yet after this one one year and four months that I've been sort of working on it. Um, I have some parts that are actually sort of working. Um, it's like the speaker. Um, I do have, I can get sound out of the speaker. Um, it is super quiet for some reason, I don't know why. And also for some of the audio formats, it actually doesn't play at all for some reason. I don't know. Um, one of the problems with the speaker is also like not very many phones in mainland actually, like Qualcomm phones have, have audio working. So it is, um, it is still kind of a new area where this, yeah. When a lot of things are kind of unknown. Um, Bluetooth, I have based on some chip, uh, on some patch set that I found. Um, you can get it on the Bluetooth. You can make the phone discoverable, so you can it's you can see it on other devices. You can actually connect other devices to it. But when you try to like on Bluetooth CTL do the scan on command, like it just fails. Um, so which is a bit weird. I don't know why. Um, probably need to spend some more time on it. And also, like, of course, all the other parts that don't work, so the modem, as I said before, I can talk with the modem via QMI, so the Qualcomm protocol. Um, but when I say, please enable yourself, it says, nope. Um, <laughs> and it doesn't say anything else, so it's kind of, kind of difficult. Um, the microphones, which is like also kind of uh, it's a different part of the audio stack. Um, the camera subsystem, which is used for receiving image data from the sensors, uh, it's not working, including the time of light sensors, like a... Um, uh, for autofocus, uh, it can be used. Um, the video encoding, decoding hardware, which is for, so you can play um, MP4, for example, without actually doing the decoding on the CPU. 
NFC, um, the fuel gauge, so for battery percentage and the charging driver, they are not working. They are actually, um, I was able to port the one from the Ford 19 kernel to mainline, um, like just import it. It does sort of work, the fuel gauge driver, but it's, it, apparently there's some weird, really weird things going on in Android where like a user space component writes something to the kernel driver and uh, without this, like nothing works basically. It's super weird. And also this be part of a USB-C, what Alfred already um, demonstrated uh, before, like it works in the hardware, but it doesn't work with mainline, just with the downstream kernel. So kind of what is the things that you need to have when you're trying to get a new SOC up? Um, it's, like you, um, it's like one of the first steps is kind of also figuring out how can you make this bootloader boot what you want to boot. Um, because in, in, the, uh, in the Android case, like Google requires some special things going on. And also the way that many man, uh, SOC manufacturers implement it is kind of sometimes working. It is working for Android and that's good enough for them. Um, but uh, for example, the DTPO partition, which is device tree blob overlay, um, on some devices you can just fast boot erase it and then it doesn't try to apply some overlay for the, for the old kernel on top of the new kernel, which doesn't work and doesn't make any sense. On some devices it just crashes and burns and yeah, it, it is not fun. Um, so mostly you can do this. And there's also on new devices with GKI, the generic kernel image from Google. Um, there's also the vendor boot partition. I actually have no idea what this one does and how you, uh, how you need to wipe it to be able to do something. Um, the serial console is actually quite useful if you can have access to it in the bootloader, if it doesn't boot. Um, like if, if you cannot even get Linux booting, normally on the serial console it will say what it's doing and why it's not doing the things that you want to do. Um, it's like, yeah, on the Fairphone 4, on the new SOC, I got the first boot actually after some hours of working on it. Um, which contains the early con, so it's just um, basically already set up um, area where the where Linux driver can write to it and you get serial output. And also the display via simple frame buffer, which is actually now way more easy than getting USB up or getting actually proper serial console up. Uh, so it's super nice, um, simple frame buffers where the bootloader already sets up the, the display, um, yeah, the display uh, hardware correctly. So um, Linux actually just has to write to some memory area the, by, uh, the bytes for the pixels and it will just magically appear on the screen. It is very nice, very useful. Um, and yeah, like the first boot was in like 180 lines of, um, of the DTSI for the SOC and 40 lines for the device. So yeah, total 220. And like no single driver change was necessary for getting a completely new SOC booting anything basically. Um, yeah, I was, I was basically just following what uh, Iskren wrote on his blog, mainlining.dev. Um, super nice. Uh, it really contains useful steps for the very, very first things that you need to do. Um, yeah, so if you want to go a bit further, uh, you very quickly start to need the clock driver, which is a GCC, a global clock controller driver. There you can basically just take whatever Qualcomm gives you. Uh, for, for, for example, for the 419 kernel, copy it over, modify a few small things, but then it works. Um, you also, at least for the 419 kernel, also these power domains, which is like, is some concept in Linux. Um, <laughs> uh, it's called, also called GDSCs. Uh, you need to, uh, they were a bit differently implemented, not, not in the GCC driver, but you should put them in the GCC driver for mainline. No, so yeah, more clocks with the RPMH. Um, also, like various other bits to, uh, you should add to the DTS because otherwise it just won't, like random things won't work, uh, which are dependencies that are not really um, expressed in the, de in the device tree, but the drivers still need, for example, access to the SMM for like doing various things. Um, these the, the definitions are basically all the same in downstream, so you can also mostly copy them over. Don't blindly copy them over because it will be a slightly different. Um, but you can definitely get good inspiration of like what you need to do. USB is of course kind of the next step because yeah, just um, staring at the tiny text on the screen is not very good debugging and you also, also don't have any input. You can do surprisingly much with simple frame buffer, but yeah, at some point you of course want uh, USB. At some point also um, pin control driver, which is the, for the pin multiplexing. Um, this is really only starts getting useful once you get to like more advanced components, let's say for like I2C and other things. Um, and also regulators are important at some point. I think that's actually 
I don't even know if you already need this for USB or not. Um, but these are kind of the, the basic components that you need, and then you can start building actually enabling various components that you find, like the flash driver, the um, vibration motor, and like things that talk I2C and things that talk other protocols. Um, so of course, le lots of things that can go wrong. Um, the IMMU is especially on new Qualcomm chips. It's, it's kind of annoying. I mean, it's less annoying than old ones, but it's still annoying um, because a lot of things, like or some things that you do, um, oh yeah, yeah, let's talk about IMMU directly first. Um, so, like, what's a bit different between downstream kernel and also mainline is the bootload already initializes some um, something in this memory segregation or like SMMU is also called. I initialize some things for the bootloader to use, for example, for the, for the internal storage, it already initialized it. Um, this then normally gets um, on downstream kernel. Um, it just continues using those and adds some ones on top. On mainline, they actually get wiped completely and need to be reset up by Linux, um, which causes some problems if the downstream kernel doesn't, um, doesn't express like which IMU to use. For, for example, for UFS, there's a very Bad example, or it's a very good example where it is bad. Um, so you kind of need to find out, find out there is a patch. Um, there you can actually dump the mappings. Um, and yeah, you can use this to like figure out what it is. Also, the device just really likes to reboot when anything is not really right. If you access some register and, the clock, and some clock isn't on that it requires, it just reboots. It doesn't give you a kernel panic, it just reboots. You're writing to wrong register, it reboots. Uh, the IMU is defined wrong, it just reboots. Um, actually, I think for the IMU, it actually sometimes gives you a message of like why, or at least that something isn't correctly, um, isn't correct, but yeah. For printing, what I've actually used sometimes is just printing the current line where it is in the driver, like sprinkling this everywhere, uh, adding a sleep of like half a second, and then seeing like, oh, this is the last line that I, that I was seeing, so it's probably um, messing up there. Like maybe also increasing the sleeps because sometimes the um, the flushing doesn't happen. Like um, printing it on the screen actually is is a bit slow. Um, what's also helpful like once you have like ser um, um, more USB up, you can actually also build various drivers as modules. Uh, and this way, actually, um, yeah, it's not built in. In where if it's built in, it loads like it's I don't know it uh, like kernel log second 0 0.5 which is quite early, and uh, it, if it then crashes immediately, you don't really have any time to beat the debug. But if you build this module, you can load it later and actually have something set up already. Um, yeah, like what is important to do if you, <laughs> if you work on this? Actually, if you have anything working, if you can, or if you have some, something working in progress, just commit this into your repository already to have a reference point to go back to, because sometimes one single line change will, break, uh, will fix everything or break everything. Um, and like you can, you, your first commit doesn't have to be perfect, obviously. Um, or, but also don't let the, um, this Git branch that you have lying around once you have something working, don't let it sit around in your local repository on your GitHub fork or in your GitLab repository or wherever forever and don't upstream it because then it will just rot there and nobody will know that it's there and they will probably, like this next person has to do exactly the same thing again, even though you have already got it working. So like already start upstreaming your patches early, like if you have simple frame buffer booting on the, on the device, upstream it. It would be very nice because then we, there's also better overview of like which SOCs have already been worked on um, and it's very nice. Um, of course, like when you upstream it, you also have to do some, some extra things, for example, adding the new compatible strings that are used in the device tree, add it to the documentation, and do some things there, but it's normally, it's, it is, yeah, some, some extra work, but it's really not too bad. And also, yeah, patches just because of how Linux development works, just takes, takes some time uh, to, uh, to get upstream. Um, so like two months later, if you go to, if you rebase on a new version, your patches are already there, so you can build on top and have, don't have like 100 patches lying on, in your own tree. Also like git send email is not difficult. Um, if there's a wonderful guide, git send email.io from the source developers, it explains it super nice. Uh, once you have it configured once, it just works. Uh, yeah, thanks for listening. In case you have one minute for questions, uh, we'll make it two, but three. Yep. When you say, uh, you said that GPU was working mm -hmm. in the framework, but you write to the area and it displays the 
Um, when you get GPU working, you should also actually get the display hardware uh, working properly. So this, um, but it's, yeah, um, this was fortunately done for on, for this SOC was done by Konrad, who is uh, who knows a lot there. Like he got the display hardware completely up and the GPU also. Um, uh, this is used for actually because simple frame buffer you cannot turn off the screen. You cannot basically do anything except just write pixels to memory, uh, write data to or by write bytes to memory area, and that's it. Um, yeah, so G you actually need to get the display hardware also up, but then you also get uh, can get the GPU up. And yeah, this one works uh, really well in mainline. Like I run performance benchmark on it, it's actually not too bad. It's actually relatively close to the downstream version. Yeah. Uh, I've contributed to the um, SVM 625. Mm -hmm. I would like to know how to upstream and manage the complexity of panels, <coughs> generated panels. Uh, ah, the, the panels. Um, yeah, the panel drivers are still, I think, in general, a question of like how they should be handled upstream because. In theory, I think the panel drivers are not really generic. Or, I mean, they they are not generic. Uh, but in theory, they they are um, relevant to the uh, to the display controller and not actually the panel itself, which is two separate parts. But like, um, f without uh, having actually access to like all the documentation that are like internal to the company, you won't find out which which driver this actually is. And Currently, let them sit around in your tree. Um, there, I mean, most of them you can also just generate from the downstream DTV, and it works. So, good enough for, for now. At some point, we probably figured out, but the uh, MSM eight, nine, sixteen people also, uh, they they have like already like twenty or thirty panels there. Last, last question, yeah. and then what happens with the trust Is that still running in the background? Is that something you can get rid of? Um, I think Truston is always running. So like the bootloader, um, which is um, like it is a signed binary and you cannot really replace it without having access to the, to the signing keys. Um, it is running, I think. And it also, it, I think this is uh, the thing that kills, your, that kills the phone like when you're doing something wrong. Uh, so no, you cannot get rid of it. I, you can probably somehow communicate with it. I know that normally the fingerprint sensor is handled via Truston. I was like, you actually talk to Truston uh, for the fingerprint. Um, but I actually don't know how this works. Okay. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you.